nice enough to drive over here and do this in person uh, this year. We were able to do it over Zoom last year. And a lot of great information and information on new products with Swix that everyone probably needs to get up to speed on. And, and uh, really appreciate Dan coming to give us a tutorial and walk through some of the, the, the Swix products and certainly just tuning in general as well. Yeah. Well, thanks, Graham. Well, thanks, Alec. Yeah, I'm Graham Lanetto. I'm an Alpine director for Swix. And uh, going to go over some uh, new products that we have. We have a new floral free line of wax. And uh, but before we get started, I just wanted to play this video for you guys. It talks about both ski room safety and working with floros. And this is about eight minutes, and then we'll get right into tuning clinic. Hello, I'm Stephen Poulin. Chief Executive Officer of Swix, the largest provider of high-performance ski wax in the world. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Today, a team member from Swix will update you on the latest and greatest developments in performance wax products and show you some of the best application methods now in use on the World Cup circuit. But first, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about three very important topics in the industry today. Number one, the USSA and FIS policies around the use of fluorinated waxes. Number two, fluorocarbons in general and their impact on the environment. And number three, personal protection equipment. The ski wax industry has used fluorinated waxes for more than 35 years, but science has evolved and so have we. Since 1946, Swix has delivered the fastest ski wax and the best equipment for every snow condition and winter sport. Our products have evolved over time to reflect our experience, our customer preferences, and the new developments in wax chemistry. We are committed to act in harmony with the environment. Science now tells us some fluorinated waxes don't break down as quickly as others. Carbon fluorine bond chemicals, or PFAS chemicals, are being singled out for regulation by countries around the globe to encourage the phase out of as many uses of fluorinated chemistry as possible. As skiers and snowboarders, we spend our lives outdoors. We want to keep our outdoor space pristine for the next generation. So we are strongly encouraging skiers and snowboarders to use only fluoro-free products. It's our goal to educate the ski racing community about the physical and chemical properties of PFAS chemicals in racing wax and how they affect the environment so you can make the best choices for responsible wax. We'll also show you the best practices for waxing safely and we'll update you on the evolving rules and regulations from FIS and USSA. Let's take a closer look at exactly what a fluorocarbon is. When the elements carbon and fluorine come together, they form one of the strongest bonds in chemistry. The carbon atoms form a backbone with the fluorine atoms attached at the side. If the backbone has eight carbon atoms, we call it a C8, or long chain fluoropolymer. If it has a backbone of six carbons, it's C6, or short chain fluoropolymer. The carbon-fluorine chains belong to a group of chemicals called PFAS. There are thousands of PFAS. They have many uses and are found in all sorts of consumer products, such as firefighting foam, medical devices, food packaging, and even the cables on the International Space Station. Ski wax companies have used extremely small amounts of PFAS in ski wax. These chemicals perform well in the extreme cold and create a slick, non-stick surface that is ideal for wet snow. But the same properties that make PFAS so popular, durability, stability in extreme cold, and water resistance, also mean they can take a long time to break down. The chemicals they break down into are also not naturally occurring and should not be part of the natural environment. Science now tells us that if we truly want to protect the environment, we should pivot away from fluorinated waxes altogether. 
Over the past three years, our scientists have led the way in using the latest advances in chemistry and other environmentally safe raw materials to create new fluorofree performance waxes that perform as well and many times perform better than the old fluorinated waxes. We believe that the best choice really is to ski fluorofree. Around the world and here in the U.S., the top competitive ski federations are also making the choice to ski fluorofree. The U.S. Ski and Snowboard, FIS, and NENSA, among others, have adopted rules that phased out fluorinated wax for ski racing. FIS, the governing body for international racing, prohibited any products made with C8 fluorocarbons at all FIS events beginning this season. FIS has said it intends to ban all fluorinated waxes once it completes its testing of the fluorine tracker. For this season in the U.S., Alpine, Freestyle, Snowboard, Free Ski, Ski Jumping, and Nordic Combined will be allowed to use C6 fluorinated waxes all season. But Cross Country will ban any fluorinated waxes from FIS sanctioned races after the Cross Country Olympic team has been selected on January 16, 2022. In the U.S., our industry is going further. All USSA sanctioned events for all ski disciplines that take place anywhere in the United States, including Alpine, Cross Country, Snowboard, Freestyle, and Free Ski, Nordic Combined, and Ski Jumping, will be 100% fluoro-free for the upcoming season. Others here and around the world are following suit. The state of Vermont enacted a ban this summer on all floral waxes. Canada has eliminated most fluorinated waxes for its ski races, and the Norwegian Ski Federation banned fluorinated glide wax for skiers under 16. You may wonder, can I be competitive without fluorinated wax? My answer to that is an emphatic yes. More and more waxes are coming on the market that deliver the same or even greater performance at multiple temperatures as fluorinated wax. We'll talk more about these new waxes later. Now, let's talk about the safety steps you should take no matter what type of wax you're using. Before you begin waxing, make sure to check for cross ventilation in the room. Also, with wax particles floating in the air, it's best to leave your food and drinks outside the waxing room. You should always wear personal protective gear and dedicated wax space clothing. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, should include a hat, work gloves, eye protection, a long sleeve shirt, long pants, closed toe shoes, an apron, and most importantly, a respirator. The respirator is essential even if you're using non-fluorinated wax. Waxing particles disperse in the air. If you inhale them, they can irritate your respiratory system. The particles are there even if you can't see them, so you should wear your respirator at all times in the waxing facility. The respirator should fit snugly around your face with no gaps, and for best practice, Use a filter that is a minimum of A1P3. Change your filter at least once a season to ensure maximum filtration. If you can smell or taste wax particles, that means a breakthrough has occurred and it is definitely time to replace your filter. We also want to be sure to properly dispose of any wax shavings. Lay down a tarp for easy cleanup. Best practice calls for a vacuum with a HEPA filter to clean your workspace. Collect the wax shavings in a garbage bag and put them in a trash that's going to a landfill. After you're done, wash your hands and face. If you make these safe and responsible waxing practices part of your routine, you'll protect yourself and those around you. I want to thank you again for watching this very important Responsible Waxing Project presentation. We hope you found this information valuable. 
as we navigate the changes in our industry and in the competitive. All right, thanks for sitting through that. So a big initiative for us is uh, safe waxing in the ski room. So start with that, but we can get right into waxing and the new wax system that we have. Get it set up here. All right. Waxing details and procedures. So we're going to focus on the new pro system here. Um, our system is floral free. We don't have any more floral waxes available. Um, it's still in the market. You can still use floral waxes for fist racing, but not for USSA racing. So just remember, if it has uh, a little symbol on it from Swix that says Future Sarah, that's C6 chain floral, you can use that. If it doesn't have that, it's C8 chain floral. And that is the floral that lasts a really long time, and that's the floral that you can't use anymore. So just check your packages. Okay, so the new system's called Pro. And Steve said in the video, does using a non-floral wax mean I'm gonna take a step back in performance? So the answer is no. So this is actually test data from Belgardena World Cup last year. And it's showing here that we have a test team that follows the World Cup around and they're always testing waxes. So this is HS category, this is a non-floral wax that we have in our system right here today. And it was the number one wax at Belgardena last year, it was beating the HF waxes. So the new waxes that we have are actually as good or better than the standard C8 or C6 chain florals that I just talked about. So what replaced the florals? So floral is kind of a special substance, it's like really versatile. It's good for repelling dirt. It's good at uh, moving water. Um, and actually, for a technician, it's nice because it kind of opens up the window of the wax, so you're not going to miss wax calls as easy. But we don't have one substance like that anymore. So what we're using is a combination of like six to eight different uh, organic uh, compounds and bringing them together in a hybrid. So each of those compounds has similar characteristics to floral, but when they're brought together in that hybrid, they're as good or better than the world. But the big thing is 100% biodegradable, 100% non-toxic, and equal friendly, all these waxes. All of our waxes are petroleum-based as well, just so you know. So with our waxes, if you want to make sure it's floral-free, it'll have this little green leaf symbol on there. Pretty easy to find. All right, so Swix is a company has two different test teams that follow the World Cup around on the Nordic side and on the Alpine side. It's pretty unique as a wax company. So there's a team of four to six people on each side, and as they follow the World Cup around, they're constantly testing waxes. So all the time, we're always testing new formulas, new recipes to find the fastest combination for the racers for that weekend, but also for you, the user. So um, what we're using for the baseline standard was the HF waxes that were in the Saranova line. So we're as good or better than the old wax line. So on the left is the old Saranova system, and on the right is the new Pro. So they look pretty similar. They're basically structured the same. The only difference is that the Pro line is going to have five different bars of wax, whereas the old Sara line has six different bars of wax but still the same sort of structure. CH, LF, and HF, but there's new language with PRO, it's PS, HS, and TS. So PS, or performance speed, is gonna replace the old CH or hydrocarbon waxes, which you, all of you, I'm sure. Um, this is a really successful line for us in the past. And really, it's exactly the same. We just changed the name. So it's PS or CH. It's exactly the same wax. Uh, really easy to use, um, inexpensive hydrocarbon wax, five different uh, harnesses for different snow conditions, and a really good training wax or race wax on a budget. Swix HS or high speed is going to replace the whole LF line. 
but it's not a direct replacement. So LF, as I showed you in that Velgordana testing, was actually beating the HF waxes. So there's a lot more performance at this category than we used to have. So it's definitely the best value uh, performance for the money. Uh, this wax also comes in five different harnesses, just like the PS line, and is offered in a solid or a liquid. When you go to HS, we have PS, HS, and TS. When you go to the HS and TS lines, you're going to find that the waxes are a lot harder. So when we use those organic hybrid compounds and we put them in the wax, it makes the wax a lot softer. So we had to really boost the hardness. So don't be surprised when you go to grab a bar of HS10 and it's much harder than you would imagine it would normally be. TSB. So TSB or black is going to replace the old HFBW line. And TSB is really good for old transformed snow, dirty snow, injected or treated snow. And it has a graphene additive that repels dirt and helps the ski uh, uh, glide with dry frictions at that bottom around. This is where the change in our line is a little tricky. So TSP or TS powders are going to replace the old HF waxes. So those are the standard paraffin waxes that you're used to seeing that have all the different colors. They're a powder now. They're not, they don't come in a paraffin block. And the reason why is these waxes are so much harder than they used to be. The powders are a lot easier to work with. So a lot of people get confused and think that this wax is actually replacing the old uh, Saranova top coat Super Saras, but it's not. It's a direct replacement for HF. And this wax right here is pretty much used for uh, new fall and snow conditions. And we have top speed and high speed liquids. So these are really easy to use, um, very cost effective. You'll, you'll get about 15 to 20 applications out of one of these containers. Um, it can be used alone as like the HS can be used alone as like a training wax every day, or it can be used as a top coat too. The TS is going to be for the maximum performance, the fastest top coat. So a wax that we've had in our line for a while, but we haven't done a great job about talking about it is the marathon waxes. So marathon waxes were developed back at the Vancouver Olympics for uh, to repel dirt and dirty snow conditions, but also be able to move a lot of water. So these waxes end up being really hard. Uh, they're basically like four hardness for um, a paraffin block, which is really hard. But it has the um, ability to move water like an HF10. So it's a pretty versatile wax. Uh, it comes in an old snow version or a new snow version. And as I said, it was so hard, the paraffin in the past, we decided to make it in a powder, which is much easier to use. This is definitely the most versatile race wax that we have. So. If I was going to say, I really only want to pick one race wax to have in my quiver, this, this is it. So it works really well in most every condition. So I do a lot of testing my, on my own. And I was uh, testing skis in Vermont in perfect HF8 conditions. I have a quiver of skis that are all exactly the same. And the top or the uh, Marathon Black was beating the HF8. And then also in really cold conditions, it was beating HF4. So it's really good if you want to make your life simple. The Marathon Series is a good race wax. Okay, Polar is not directly in the pro line, but it's part of our system. And basically it's CH4. So we just rebranded it under Polar. So the old CH4 that you're used to, the really hard green wax, it comes in a paraffin or a powder form as well. All right, Swix biowaxes. As I mentioned, all of our waxes are petroleum-based. Norway, uh, Swix is a Norwegian company, and we have access to a lot of petroleum there. So this wax is a little bit different because it's made from recycled petroleum product. So it's a, a bit more environmentally friendly. Uh, it's a great training wax. It comes in three different hardnesses, and it's really simple to use. I put this slide in here to kind of explain the base prep line a little bit because people get a little confused about how to use these waxes. So BP99 is a soft wax with a low melting point. 
It's really recommended as a first wax on new skis. When you're trying to get some wax in the skis to protect them, it's a lot easier to work with than the harder waxes. And it's also really good for use in a thermal bag or a hot box because of the low melting point. DP88 is good for normal winter conditions and used on new skis for travel wax. So if you're putting your skis in a bag and traveling, BP-88 is a good choice. And then BP-77 is the hardest of the three. It's really good for new skis to kind of break the uh, hairs off the structure when you're first waxing a pair of skis. And it can also be used for a glacier training wax. Okay, we talked about PPE. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, different PPE uh, ski room recommendations are actually based off the fluoros that we were talking about. But as Steve said in that video, it's a good idea to uh, to practice wearing those PPE in the ski room. The mask that my coworker Evan was wearing, a huge mask, could be a little bit overkill for the non floral waxes, but for fluorinated waxes, it's a good idea. Okay, so we'll get into waxing here. So with waxing, um, probably the best thing that you can do to make your life a lot easier is to buy good quality digital iron. So this is our whole iron lineup that we have. We have a lot of different price points, and they all work fairly well. But once you get to the T72, which is this iron in the middle, um, it's a digital iron that has a really precise thermostat, and the temperature only varies a little bit. The base plates on those irons are much thicker, and they have a lot more heating elements inside. So when you're working with the harder waxes, it definitely makes the process a lot easier. Also, this is something that you can have for your ski racing career, and if it ever breaks and you need to get a warranty, you just shoot an email and I can take care of it really quickly for you. So it's a good idea to prep your iron before you use it. Just like your skis, when they come out of the wrapper, they need to be prepped. And a lot of times it's a good idea just to kind of sand the base plate of your iron down smooth and, and even with 300 grit sandpaper on the flat surface. And then in season two, it's a good idea to do this. So if your irons get nicked or dinged, you can uh, clean it up really easy with some sandpaper like this. <clears throat> Once you get it flat and you get the burrs off, then you get a 400 grit or 600 grit and uh, have a really nice smooth finish. Then you can just protect your iron in the bag. And then getting into the waxing here. So on all of our waxes, there's going to be a recommended iron temperature. So this is PS10, and the iron temperature rating is 123 Celsius. So uh, if it was PS5, it would be 155. So the harder waxes have a higher temperature, obviously. Um, there's two different things there. It's going to protect the wax from getting burnt or damaged, and it'll protect your skis from getting damaged as well. But also, we've done a lot of testing with these waxes that we found that these temperature ratings are the best for maximum performance in glide with the skis. So it's beyond just the application, it's actually the performance of the wax. Okay, so tips when you're ironing. Buy good quality iron, Use the iron lengthwise, like I'm showing in this top picture here. When you use the iron sideways, you just reduce the heating element by 50%. So the iron's not going to be as efficient when you use it like that. When you're ironing, we're trying to get the wax into the skis with just two passes. So you should be able to just drip the wax on the ski and make two full length passes to get the wax in, and that's it. If you're, if you're doing more than that, you're not doing these techniques correctly. So use the iron of the base plate, beveled edge is the leading edge. So in that top picture again, looks like I'm using that iron backwards, but it's actually, the beveled edge is actually on the back of the Swiss iron, so that's the front. And that's going to help the iron glide over the wax easier. And I'm going to push down with moderate pressure when I'm ironing, and even lift the front of the iron just, just a bit as I'm moving down the speed to help it glide. So when I'm ironing, and I'm heading down the ski, I don't want the wax trail behind the iron to be much bigger than the iron itself. So if I'm having a wetness that's really stretching out, I want to pick up the speed of the iron so that wetness comes back up to the iron itself. 
If you're moving slower than that, you're transferring a lot of heat down through the ski, and you can actually damage your ski. So what happens when you overheat your ski? So a ski is built with a lot of different components. There's wood, titanol, carbon, metal. There's a lot of different pieces in there. They're all held together by resins. And those epoxy resins are constantly breaking down. So every time that you're out skiing, you make a turn, the ski is starting to break down. But when you load up your ski full of heat, and you're making passes and that, that ski is getting wet, the wax is wet, you're driving all that heat down through the ski. So all those different layers are starting to expand and contract at different rates, and you're breaking down the actual integrity of the core of your ski. And also, you're burning the base material. So there was a guy I used to work with years ago that uh, did a lot of hot scraping. So he would clean the skis by using a soft wax, and he'd run the iron, scrape it off, put wax on again, scrape it off. And the skis would be wet, and just really, the skis would be bent over from all the heat. But when he'd scrape, he'd get down to the end of the ski, and he'd say, look at all this dirt coming off the ski. And I was letting my skis cool off to room temperature, and I'd scrape them, and I wasn't getting any dirt. So what I found was, he was actually planing the base material off the skis by getting them too hot. So that was changing the base bevel of the ski. But also, at the end of the year, his skis were so twisted and concave and convex from that heat going through, my skis were still pretty stable. So I think it's really important to keep the heat to a minimum on the skis. So a good way to do that is uh, by using a roller waxer. So these are pretty cool. Uh, new product for us this year. Super inexpensive, actually. Uh, we have these different trays that you can drop in for waxes a day. And basically, once your skis are ready to wax, you can just do one pass over the roller. It puts a really nice thin layer of wax on, and then you can just make one pass with an iron, and the wax is into the ski. Okay, so before you get ready to wax your skis, um, we want to clean the base. So after we've done our edge work, we need to make sure we take a plastic scraper and scrape off any uh, edge material that might be into the ski, brush it out really good. And then we want to use a glide wax cleaner to clean the base of the ski. So this isn't the old uh, glide, uh, base cleaners from like Nordic skiing that we use to clean the kick wax off. This is a wax uh, cleaner that's meant to condition the ski to take wax more over time. So it's going to clean this the top layer top layer of the ski so you can put the wax of the day in. So the way this worked in the past for us was, as I mentioned, as you use this glide wax cleaner, it helped your skis accept more wax. So floral is bound to floros. So this old wax cleaner actually used to have floros in it. So if you have any of this old wax cleaner, it's probably a good idea to get the new. But as I mentioned, it's floral free, so it's looked for the week on, on the um, package there. But once those skis clean and ready to wax, you're going to put a little bit of that glide wax cleaner on a piece of fiberline. Just rub it on the base of the ski, and when you're done, let it dry. It takes about 10 minutes and brush it out with the blue nylon, and you're ready to wax your skis. I like to cover the bindings to keep any wax from dripping all over the bindings. I'm going to drip the wax on. You check the iron temperature, put the wax of the day on. I make one pass down the ski in a kind of a zigzag pattern on the way back. Don't be afraid to put the wax on your skis. Even with your race waxes, your more expensive race waxes, a package about this big, you're probably only going to be able to wax about four pairs of skis. And if you're doing any less, if you're, if you're trying to get more out of it, there's a good chance that you might actually damage your base of your ski. So 40 grams is about 10 grams per ski. All right, we're going to distribute the wax with two passes. So as I said before, the first pass is going to be for distributing the wax. The second pass, we want to make sure we're going nice and even, keep not overheating the ski. We want to see the wax drop down into the ski, and I want to be able to see the structure of the ski stand proud. I don't want to see any of the uh, drippings from when I first drip the wax off. Remember not to overheat your skis. <clears throat> Wait about 10 or 15 minutes until they're room temperature. Basically, all you have to do is feel them. If you don't feel any heat anymore, they're ready to scrape. 
Okay, we're going to scrape off all the excess wax. Um, good idea to, to, of course, you're using a plastic scraper. And you want to make sure it's nice and sharp. That's an electric scraper sharpener that we have that works really well. And of course, we have less expensive options that are actually a file and a guide. And it's always good to have some 300 grit sandpaper around when you're sharpening your scrapers to knock any burrs off. And then we want to scrape off as much wax as we can. We want wax in the base, not on top of the base. So we're going to scrape and scrape and scrape. I like to work in like 12 inch sections, scraping from the tip to the tail. And uh, when you use your scraper, make sure you put your fingers on that side, your thumbs on the back, and you're only holding it at a slight angle. I see people that push. It's not a good idea. I think there's a good chance that you could actually damage your ski that way. But work in a 12 inch section, scrape off as much as you can, and move to the next section there. If you're having difficulty scraping, it's because your scraper is dull. Okay, so as I said, we want the wax in the ski, not on top. So if there's wax on top of the ski, on top of the base, it's going to pick up dirt and make your ski slower. So even after we do this progression of scraping and brushing, when your skis go outside, it's going to be cold, the base material is going to shrink and purge more wax out. It's not really that big of a deal for training, but on race day, I would definitely recommend taking a scraper up to the start. Scrape down the ski, you're going to find there's a lot more wax that's on top of the base, and brush it out. <clears throat> Clean the side walls, and then we're going to brush the remaining wax from the structure. So the idea with these brushes is we want to get into the structure and remove the last little bit of paraffin that's laying in the low areas here. And the only way to really get at that is by go through a brush progression. And we have a lot of different brushes in our line, but I recommend three different brushes just to kind of keep it easy. So we have a large oval steel brush, a medium bronze brush, and a wood, or a nylon brush, any of the nylon brushes are fine. But uh, the first brush there, the large oval steel, is a really good brush to break in new skis. It's also really good for cold uh, waxes to get them out of the ski. The uh, bronze brush in the middle is kind of the workhorse in the group, does most everything pretty well. Any of the brushes that have metal on them, you're probably going to have to replace them every couple of years. Usually, if you're skiing 100 days per year, you'd have to replace them every year. And then the white nylon brush there is the best for polishing at the end. We make rotor brushes and all those different combinations. The rotor brushes are really good if you're doing a lot of skis. It's a lot faster. And it does a really nice job of polishing. We have a new rotor brush handle that has a suction. Um, so you hook it up to a HEPA filter and it keeps the particulates from flying up in the air. And this is a new brush for us this year that's actually been really successful. So this is a, a merino wool brush. It looks a little funny, but it actually works really good. So it's a natural fiber. And you know, think back to that picture I showed of the, the paraffins down in, into the grooves of the uh, structure. This brush will actually kind of fit into those contours and, and melt that wax and coat the structure. So it does a really nice job with cold waxes. And also, we have liquid waxes that go down to category six. We don't have anything colder, category five or polar. So what we're doing for those cold categories, uh, layover waxes, is using that marathon paraffin wax that I talked about. And what we do is we prep the ski for racing, scrape and brush it out completely. And then we take that marathon wax and we burn it into the wool roto. So you burn that wax into that roto brush and then once it's all set, you make three passes from tip to tail, and that's a cold weather layover. So I have videos for all this. I think maybe I shared it with you a couple weeks ago, Tyler, but I can share it again. We have the application videos for all, all these waxes. Okay, so once you're done with that, make sure you strap, strap up your skis, and then we'll bounce over to you, uh, some edging. Okay, 
Well, first of all, do you guys have any questions on waxing at all before we move on? Yeah. Can you speak to the liquids versus the wax and hot wax iron and scrape process? Yeah. Uh, the liquids are super easy to use. Uh, they're actually quite durable. I actually, I would say recommended use is to wax with a paraffin and then uh, let's say you went out trained, you could actually ski on the liquid three days in a row. When you get to the fourth day, use the paraffin again. If you want to stick, have some paraffin in the base, just for protection. Uh, it's really important that you just put out a thin layer. So uh, when working with these waxes, it comes out really fast. And so you want to shake it up. and. Uh, you want to hold it really low and move quickly on the ski. If you hold it up here, it's going to broadcast all over the place, and you'll get too much wax on your skis. Mm -hmm. So I was just working with the boys, uh, the D team boys at the Copper, and one of the boys said that he put he he didn't understand why it didn't dry. He sprayed so much wax on the skis that it, this wasn't. It took like a half an hour to dry. This should take about five minutes to dry. But once I showed him, it's that quick. That's it. That's it. You don't want any more than that. And then five minutes later, you can buff it or brush yeah, it? Yeah, so, so you, you can ski on it just like that. Um, I'd say uh, probably the best thing to do is to use uh, a blue nylon brush to brush it out. But Norway was just telling me and using that um, roto wool brush was really good. As a, as a the brush. roto brush. Yeah, the roto wool. That the big roto -wool. fluffy one. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. How do you wax the powders? The powders. So um, these are actually pretty easy to use. Um, basically, what you do is check the iron temperature on the on the container here, and then I'm just going to coat the ski like this. And then I'm just going to take my iron and make two passes. That's it. This stuff's really easy to work with. If it was the paraffin version where you had to like melt it and drip it on, it's really difficult to work with. That's why we have all these powders, because the waxes are so much harder. Um, but it's not difficult to work with like the old Saranova waxes, like the old layover, you know, really C12 chain fluoros. This stuff's easy to work with and safe. And I have videos for that too, so I'll make sure they go out to you guys. And if you were to invest in a hot roller, I mean, isn't that a lot of wasted wax that just gets sits in there or you just reheat it and use it? Is there any problem with heating it up again and again and again to use the vat of paraffin that's in there? No, it's okay. Um, what's unique about our roller waxer is uh, it's digital. So you can dial it right into the wax um, gradients that we recommend. And uh, no, I mean, the wax seems to be pretty good. I, I haven't had any problems with it. Like the, the older ones I've used from other companies, they get really hot and can burn the wax. Mm -hmm. But uh, ours seems to be pretty stable. And you can't really change the wax temperature in that very easily, it seems like, right? I mean, does it have different trays that you can have a tray yes. of? Yeah, so I, did, I didn't mention that. So we have trays that go with it. So it comes with a tray, but you can buy trays from us too for, I think, $60. So, so if you, you invested in like four trays, you could have CH5, CH, well, whatever the new whatever ones you are. Want yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, um, Heat that up, roll it on, then one single pass with the base up with your iron. Yep. And then wax. Yep. Yeah, so I I I tune a lot of skis for the US ski team at the Center of Excellence. We have a ski tuning center there. Uh, and we use that quite a bit and it works great. Is it wide enough for snowboards? It's not. No. Winter Snagger makes one that's wide enough for snowboards, but it's a thousand dollars. So you can do two passes, uh -huh. but that's the trick. Yeah, because all you're using it for is to apply a thin layer of wax, right? You're not really warming the base with that process. That's the job of the you're iron. You're just spreading the wax, yeah. And does it use about the 10 grams that you recommended using when you said it uses about 10 grams it, per pair? It, it might be even a little bit more efficient. Okay. So I used to have a ski race a store in Stowe, Vermont for about 16 years. And uh, when I trained my employees to wax skis, uh, I found Thaddeus put on a lot more wax than Cam. You know, it was all over the map. On a roller, on a hot roller? Uh, well, by hand. You know, oh, they by were hand. waxing by hand. 
And at that point, I ended up moving to a roller, and it made things so much more consistent because the guys were all putting on the same amount of wax, and, and my consumables stretched further. So I was getting more money out of the bar of wax. So you definitely save some money with it for sure. And, and uh, it's, it's priced super aggressively. I, I think your guys' price on it is like $170. And your ratio of one iron job for three sprays is pretty accurate? Like literally just... I, I'll be honest with you, I never iron wax my own skis anymore. I only use this. And my skis are in great shape. What about the guys on the World Cup who you've been training for? So with power with, the with solemn so skis, a lot of guys only use liquids because the solemn skis are really unstable and they seem to get out of whack really easy, especially with the heat. <laughs> so we've, we've moved to using liquids on solemn skis. GS skis is that combination of the paraffins and the, the liquids. Super G and downhill, we're definitely still using paraffins, but we use this as a top coat for racing. Does the like does the powder wax does it like change the speed like it feels like a hard wax instead of powder wax? Is it is it faster? Just like with the cheap with the speed change. Uh, well, if you're picking the right wax for the conditions, yeah, it, it makes the skis faster for sure. But are you actually talking about the application or the skiing portion? Well, I'm talking about like. Say you have both like the same temperature waxes, the powder and like a hard wax, which one would be faster for the change? Um, they'll perform the same if you put them on correctly. Oh. Yeah. But what I'd say about the paraffin wax, the hard paraffin wax, is most people would probably burn their skis because they don't know how to apply it correctly. It's hard to work with. So I would say this is going to be a much safer choice for most people. Question about the wool rotor brush. Do you recommend different brushes for different waxes? Or? Yeah. Okay. So with all this stuff, you can go crazy with it. You know, but what I would do is I'd have a roto wool brush that was dedicated to uh, TS5, another one for Marathon White, Marathon Black, you know, like because I don't want to cross contaminate my brushes. But uh, it just depends on how far you want to go with it. So PS, performance speed, is for training. HS, high speed, is the first race wax. And then TS is the, the highest level race wax. Yeah. Was your slide that you showed had them in order? Yeah. Yeah, when I went through. I couldn't remember on that slide. The top PS, one was the training, and the very bottom one was the highest performance race. Uh, no, it was the bottom was the basic, and the top, okay. the top level was the highest. And liquids are available in both of those segmentations. And TS and HS waxes, yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so this this bottle is a little bit bigger. This is uh, the first version is CH7. Now it's called uh, HS7. Um, the way I applied it, I get 22 to 25 pairs of skis out of it. And your cost on, on a liquid wax is... Uh, $18. So it's pretty cost effective. Graham, when you're trying to select, and, and for everybody in here, we are getting this video, so we'll be able to send out a video link if you like, ah, I couldn't get all the notes and want to refer back to something. Um, but uh, when you're picking your wax based on temperature, we can get pretty detailed now, weather forecast by the hour and all that kind of stuff. What do, what do you use in air temperature versus snow temperature yeah, and all that? That's a great question. So traditionally we had a wax chart. We don't have a wax chart right now in this new, new system. And uh, so uh, part of it's just it's new and marketing and racing are trying to come together and figure this out. But so generally speaking, what you do is like look at the ambient air temperature. So you say, oh, my race is going to be at 8 o'clock tomorrow. I'd look at an hourly forecast. Maybe I'd even look an hour before, you know, just in case. It's probably going to be a little bit on the colder side. And then you'd have to look at the snow crystal. And if the snow crystals were really aggressive, the big ball in snow, um, you'd probably want to harden the wax. But in the HS and TS categories, as I mentioned, these waxes are already harder. So you don't have to harden any of these waxes. So 
Um, I was a little frustrated we don't have a wax chart, but the reality is all you need to do is look at the ambient air temperature and pick that wax because it's already hard, so you don't have to make any adjustments for different snow crystals. And then pick your level of performance. So PS to me, PS performance speeds racing on a budget. Uh, HS is the best value for sure, and then top speed is what every, every tenth of a second counts. It adds up pretty quick. Any other questions on wax? Does graphite go with these waxes? Graphite? Yeah, so any of the waxes that are black, they have a graphene additive, and that repels dirt. Otherwise, no. All right. Cool. Well, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask me at the end. We'll jump into edge preparations here. talk about edge angles real quick and then we'll go into the basic maintenance for you guys. So base bevel is going to be the bevel of the actual base edge of the ski where the contact point of the ski's edge is to the snow. Base bevel is going to control how reactive the ski is. So you could have the best system, best boots, best skis, best bindings. If the base bevel is not set right, none of it will work. So it's really important that you have it set correctly. The base bevel is going to control how quickly the ski will edge. The flatter the base bevel, the quicker the ski. So too little base bevel will leave your skis feeling rail or overly aggressive, and too much base bevel will leave them feeling dead and damp without any energy. So one thing to remember is, once the base bevel is set, you don't want to touch it again. So there's two ways you can damage your skis. It's one with the heat from iron. The other one is if you're working on your skis at home in the, in the ski room and you're pulling a ply along the base. So a lot of people think, oh, my, my ski edge is a little dinged up, I want to pull a file. But if your ski is set at a half degree, two pulls of a file, you're at three quarter. You do it again, you're at one degree. So you're going to make your skis less and less reactive every time you touch that base that way, so don't touch it. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that base bevel will change over time naturally. So, you know, once again, the ski core, you know, all those different materials are held together by epoxy resins. And just from using the skis, the base bevel will slowly increase. So, some skis are more stable than others. I've had some skis that that base bevel would stay stable after 80 days on snow, and I've had some that had changed after four days on snow. So, it just depends on the model of ski and how well it was built. But, um, it's a slow erosion of performance. It doesn't happen right away, you don't feel it. But there's a couple of things that you can kind of keep an eye out to make sure that it's correct. So if you start the season and the coach is looking at the canteen, you know, how you're standing in your boots and they like how everything looks, but a month or two later, the coaches want to start doing some can strips on your bindings. That's a, a clear indication that something changed at the base level. I've never seen a coach take out a true bar and check the base level before doing that camp work. So it's really important to make sure you get that checked out. Also, if you're skiing, you know, for instance, if you're skiing on a three degree, half degree setup, and you hit some ice, three degree, half degree should rip on ice. It shouldn't slide at all. If the ski slides and you feel it and it's still super sharp, that's a pretty clear indication that the base valve is probably moved to like a one degree, and the skis need to be reground and reset that base valve. Uh, people ask me all the time, should I do a half degree or a three quarter degree? I'm not sure what I want to do. But I always say start with less because you can always add more. It's really easy to take a file and with a couple of pulls, you're at 0.75 degree really easy. But if you go from 0.75 and you want to go back to half degree, the only way to do that is by getting your skis still ground. So you have to get the skis flattened on the stone, you have to restructure the base, and then you have to reset the base bevel. Okay, size bevel. This is where you're going to be working mostly on your skis. So, base bevel is going to control how reactive the ski is. Side edge bevel is going to control 
how powerful the ski is on edge. So the sharper the angle, the more edge hold that you'll have. But the sharper angle is less durable. And it's going to require more tuning. So again, people ask me, should I be using a two degree or a three degree bevel? And my question is, how often are you tuning your skis? So if you are skiing four days a week, but only tuning one day a week, a two degree is going to be a better fit because it will stay sharper longer. If you are tuning your skis on a regular basis, the three degree is obviously going to give you better performance, but you're maintaining it. So we have durability versus power here. So this is an angle that you can actually check in your ski room pretty easy. So if you have a true bar and a base a side edge guy, you can actually check to see what angle you have on your side edge. So you have to make sure your workspace well lit, and then you place your side edge guide against the base of the ski, and place your true bar on top of the guide and walk it down to the ski edge. So with the true bar and the side edge guide in place, you should see no light across where the true bar interfaces with the edge of the ski. So if I was trying to see if this was a three degree, there's no light there, so I know I have a three degree angle. If there's light showing on the binding side, that means it's more aggressive of an angle. So if I was shooting for a three degree, maybe that would be a four degree. What usually happens is this one in the middle. So usually a negative angle is what you end up pulling. And you can see just a little bit of light towards the base edge side. And then of course, this is what we're trying to get. So usually that sidewall material is in the way, and you'll pull a negative angle. So there was a kid that worked for me years ago at my store. He was a pretty decent ski racer. He was like a 15-point psalm ski. And I was asking him what he was using for a side edge bevel. And he said, oh, I have a 40 degree. And I could see where his file was hitting the side wall of the ski. So as I was talking to him, I pulled out my true bar and my file guide. And I checked, and he actually had a 1 degree on the ski. He was using a four degree guide, it'll still sharpen the ski, but it will pull a negative angle. So I used to do World Cup service and I worked with a girl that was top three in the world. And she was a really good slalom skier. And a 45 second course, the difference between a four degree and a three degree for her was three tenths of a second. So this, this guy was probably giving up, you know, half a second over two runs. So we have to make sure that we remove that sidewall material with the sidewall planer. So we want to set that blade up so it's as close to the edge as we can get without touching the edge and remove that material. You're going to have to do this probably every three or four times that you sharpen. Because once you remove that material, every time you sharpen, you're going to get closer and closer to the side edge, sidewall again. So you have to remove that material. If you're a ski racer, you have to own one of these tools. So what we're doing is, on a new pair of skis, um, there's usually a little bit of sidewall that kind of mirrors the actual edge itself, so we want to remove that material. We want it to be recessed enough so when we come in with our file guide, that our file can set the right angle. You can see if, it, if you're hitting here, it's going to pull negative. So it's really important that we have that recess and pulled out of the way so we can get a precise angle. Okay, sharpening by hand. So when you're sharpening by hand, um, make sure that you use a hard clamp, C-clamp. Um, a lot of our Swix file guys will actually have it built in. So that's going to make sure that that file is really held in there um, nice and tight, won't move at all. If you're using one of these spring clamps, which most people do, every time that you pull with your file, you're probably getting a negative angle and moves. Plus, this is kind of a dangerous setup because if you could slip and cut your hand pretty easy with, with that um, spring clamp. So make sure you uh, have a, a nice, strong C-clamp in place for filing. Um, also, make sure that you use a file that's basically about the same size as the actual guide. You know, this was a 12-inch file. If I'm using a 12-inch file, especially with a slalom ski like this, it's going to hang up from point to point and won't cut in the middle. So a lot of times what I'll do is just leave the file and the sheet and just snap it in half on the bench and then you'll get two smaller files that will cut better. Okay, so setting up for the job. So we're going to need the sidewall cutter, a file brush to clean the file, medium rice file with the clamp, and a file guide. I like to use three diamond stones. And for the diamond stones, I'll use a spring clamp. 
and the white surrounding stone and the gummy. So this is the point in the clinic where maybe after a day of training you're coming into the ski room and you have to assess your edges to decide if you're going to sharpen or not. So most people over sharpen their edges. All you need to do is take a plastic scraper and if you can get a scraper to pull off with ease on the edge, all you need to do is go through a diamond stump progression which I'll show you. If, if it's not pulling off easy, you're going to have to sharpen your skis with a file or a machine. Okay, so we want to make sure that we remove that excess sidewall material. Did you bring that tool with you? What's that? That sidewall removal tool. Do I have one? Yeah, here. That's one of the hardest tools to use. Yeah, I would say um, when you're getting used to using one, just find some skis you don't care about and play around with it and just work the setup. Uh, there's a particular way to hold it too so it doesn't jump on you. Yeah. And some sidewalls are going to be really soft, called penal. They're hard to work with. Um, if it's a hard fiberglass sidewall, it's a lot easier, um, if you, especially if you have a sharp blade. Uh, before we actually sharpen the edge, what we want to do is just take a 200 grit diamond stone and file about it. And we want to remove any sort of burr or um, damage from training. So if you were out training and you hit a rock, it creates heat and it hardens the edge. Your file won't cut through that. So it's really important that we take this 200 grit diamond stone and the, the proper uh, edge guide and just run it back and forth until we hear it kind of cut clean and take away any of that case hardening and then we're ready to file. So, one of the biggest things about sharpening skis that I see happen is people don't remove the same amount of material off the ski from tip to tail. So when I had my ski racing store, at the end of the season I would look over people's skis that came in, I'd look at the tips and the tails and they'd look like they were essentially brand new skis, and I'd look at underneath the waist and they would be paper thin. So they were removing more material in the waist of the ski than the tip and tail. So what happens with that is actually you're adding turn radius. So the ski's actually going to turn easier. But in ski racing, we want to go down the hill. So you're actually going to be slower by adding that turn radius to your ski. So it's really important that you make sure you pull a consistent amount from tip to tail. So after we sharpen the ski, you know, using a file, we're literally ripping the edge apart. So when you feel it for sharpness, it feels pretty impressive after you've sharpened your skis. But there's a big burr hanging on, and we want to clean that burr up for two different reasons, for safety and performance. So if you go out and ski on that burr, and it's icy, what will happen is that burr will roll over, and your skis will actually be less sharp. And then also, I feel that that serrated edge is a little bit more dangerous um, as a ski racer. Uh, I think a clean, smooth edge is going to be a lot safer if you, if you have any issues with falling on it. Um, so what we want to do is take the ceramic stone, and that has no abrasive quality. This is the only stone that I'll actually use on the base edge. If you're using a diamond stone, these are miniature files. And the more you use them, the more bevel you're going to add to your skis. So try to stick with the ceramic. And when I hold the ceramic, um, I'm holding it at a point where the side edge and base edge come together. Right where that burr is, I want to push it up. So I'm showing here in my picture, there's a, a dime underneath the bottom of that just to show the kind of angle that I'm holding that stone. And I'm pushing with moderate pressure to push that burr up. So once we do that, they're going to feel the skis and they're going to feel horrible. It's like all that sharpness that you just, that you just created is gone. But we're going to go through diamond stone progression. And we're going to make a cleaner, smoother edge. So we'll go to the 200 grit diamond stone with our spring clamp and our file guide. We'll run that up and down the edge. And then that sharpness comes back right away. And when I, when I feel it with my hand, we have a smoother, cleaner edge. But it's still burnt, so I just use my 200 grit diamond stone. So then I go back to my ceramic, go right on that base edge, push that up again. And now I go to my 400, do the same thing with my 600. So there's a play of creating a burr, knocking it back, creating a burr, knocking it back until you have a nice, smooth, clean edge. Okay, uh, so when you're done, you have a generically sharp ski, and that's how I like to leave it in the ski room, and I'll make it any adjustments for snow conditions when I get out on the, on the slope. 
I'll talk more about that here in a second. I just want to talk about the Evo. So this is a, a machine sharpener that we have. It actually has a, a disc in it that spins at 10,500 RPMs. And unlike a file that's ripping the edge apart, this actually hones the edge to sharpness just from the uh, disc spinning on the edge. So it's uh, self-adjusting. The, uh, the disc follows the contour of the edge. It's adjustable on the back from zero to five degree. And you can change out the aggression of the machine just by swapping out these discs. So they pop in and out really easy. It comes with a fine. We have a coarse, medium, fine, and extra fine. Um, basically for me, I like to use the medium disc. It's a little bit more aggressive for super icy conditions. The, the fine's really good for um, dry grippy snow, which I know you guys have a lot of here. And then the extra fine, really for me, is replacing the diamond stones. It's just, my skis are pretty sharp. And I can put that extra fine disc in there and just make one pass and we're ready to go. Uh, the cool thing about this machine is it sweeps up while it's cutting. Most of the machines sweep down, so they end up leaving the skis really hot. They're not burr, but they're really aggressive. So it requires going back to the ski and doing that touch up with the diamond stone and the, uh, the ceramic stone, I should say. Um, with this spinning up the edge, you can sharpen the ski and you can ski on it as is. So, my daughter uh, was a U12 racer, and I'd use this on her skis. I'd make three passes after a day of training. The skis were sharp. I'd use a liquid wax right here. I could sharpen and wax her skis in four and a half minutes. I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit to that, but uh, it actually works really well. It's awesome. Uh, okay, so I talked about this, how it works. So in terms of material, material removal, on that thing versus a say a medium file? Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, um, so what did I say? Every three third or fourth time that you sharpen up the file you'd have to remove the sidewall material. Maybe this is like every five or six times. So it removes it's less material than a less file. Less material, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really handy. Like I don't file by hand anymore. I just I just use the Evo. And I use it for downhill super G. Any, any of the any of the I was just trying to do it a little bit here. Um, but it's really easy to use. Um, so basically, it's directional. Uh, you're always going to use it from your right to your left. And the reason why is because that disc is held in by friction. You can pull it backwards. It might unseat the disc. It's not really a big deal. Uh, a lot of people, when they first use this machine, they really want to grip it super tight. But you want to let this machine do the work. It's very easy. So I'm going to pick my angle. I'm going to put a three degree on. I'm going to start over on my right. I made sure I removed that sidewall material. We'll talk more about that. But I'm just going to set it up like that. I turn it on. Once it gets up to speed, I just drop it. I literally just push in with one finger. I'm not holding this thing at all. I'm just pushing in to make sure it's right against the base. And I found the slower you go with this, the better the finish. So I'm just making my way down the ski, and as I come up to the tip, I'm just going to kind of follow the contour of the edge and come right off the ski like that. So I'll make three passes, and the skis are sharp. It's super easy. All right, so just as we did with filing by hand, we want to prep the edge with that 200 grit diamond stone, knock off any of the burrs. We still have to remove the sidewall material. Um, when I was at Copper, I was looking over some skis and doing an assessment, and one of the boys had a Try One, a $3,000 tuning machine, and he was using it, he was sharpening his skis, but he was never removing the sidewall material. So even with that big machine, it was pulling a negative angle. So we have to make sure we do that. Okay, I just showed you how to use the machine. It's pretty easy. And then that leads us to setting up the skis for conditions. So. I have a nice sharp ski. Let's say that you went to some races in the east and it was super icy. I would just leave it as is. You know, that you want a nice sharp ski for super icy conditions. I know you guys, as I mentioned, have a lot of dry grippy snow here, so we're going to have to adjust for that. So we want the ability to spit it, slide, and then stand on the ski. And if the ski is really sharp, you're not going to be able to do that. So what we're going to do is, I'd say, take a run on the ski, get a feel for them. They feel really grippy and overly aggressive. Take that ceramic stone, 
and just run it along the base edge again, that's naturally going to pull back some of the sharpness of the ski. And then I just use this little gummy. So these are two, two tools that you should have on you on the snow all the time. What we're going to do is take this gummy snow, make a 5 inch pass, 10 inch pass, 15, and you keep going to the heel of the boot. So now we have the skis progressively less sharp to the tail. I'll make one full length pass up like this, and I'm going to just kind of do the same procedure and pull a little bit of the sharpness back in the tip. This part of the ski is kind of the power zone, the slot of the ski. If you look at a picture of somebody really bending the ski, a lot of times this part of the ski will be out of the snow, and same with back here. This is where you're going to drive all your power, so I like to leave this kind of on the sharper side, but I want to be able to articulate the ski like that. That works really well. Uh, but the key is, um, before you race, scan your skis. Get a feel for them. Find a pitch that's similar to the race hill and get a feel for them. If they feel really grippy, pull back the sharpness. If you don't do that, you're going to be surprised on first run, and you're going to have a tough first run. You're never going to get that first run back. You can always go back up to the start and refresh in your wax. That's super easy. But as I said, you want, you'll never get that first run back. Right, so then we prep for waxing. We already talked about this, scraping off the excess uh, filings, and that's it. So if I compare it to the knowledge I have from the past, a lot of it is the same, but the big, big change that you described is the machine through yeah. the edges and the liquid wax. Yes. And I'm quite surprised how you say it for your daughter. You just, you, you prepare the ski like super quick. Yeah, you know, I always thought, I always thought that when my daughter became a ski racer, I spent hours working on the skis. Yeah. And I, I don't, you know, like, it's, it's, this machine is the same machine that I use with the national team guys. Yeah. And I use it for my daughter. It, what's cool about it, actually, is as a youth, as a youth 12, I try to teach her how to file. And it's scary. It's yeah. scary. Like watching my daughter use the valve is really, it made me really nervous. But if she's wearing the proper PPE, I can show her how to how to use this machine, and she gets sharp and skis as well as I can. So it's actually a really cool tool for younger racers. Yeah. Um, easy to use. Just make sure you aren't PPE. Yeah, and then and then one more time about the liquid uh, wax. In the beginning, you said you you like to put a little bit of paraffin wax uh, in the base, and then do the liquid wax yep. on top. But like once it's, and, and you said like uh, one time uh, paraffin, like three times liquid, but it sounds later you kind of said, well, I just only use liquid. So. With the slalom skis, and, and, my per, and my personal skis too. Like, yeah. like I never I never wax my own skis with yeah. anything but the liquid. Yeah. And I can tell you, it works really well. They're, it's durable. I haven't had any issues with base burn. Um, yeah. But as a company, our platform has used that paraffin every third time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah. thank you so much. You're welcome. Yep. When you know uh, <coughs> your diamond stones are done? They don't last very long. That's, that's a great question. Um, files, files and diamond stones are consumables and they don't last long. So honestly, out of, out of a file, you're probably going to get about 15 tunes, and then it's going to be done. If you can pull right and left-handed, you'll get 30 because you can use all four sides of the file. Uh, the diamond stones, if they hit any wax on your sidewall, they're done. Like, you got to be really careful keeping them clean and out of the way of any, any wax. You know, like if I was doing any edge work and waxing, I'd take all my edge work, all my edge tools off the table if I was waxing. And also, you can just look at them too. If you just look at them in the light, it's basically sandpaper. And if you look closely and you don't see that, that sandpaper aggression, they're done. So, actually, I have I have kind of a cool spreadsheet that I built that I can share with you guys. That as a, as a racer, you can just put in your training days, and it, it kicks out exactly like your consumables that you need to buy because I had it all based off of you know, a, a file last 15 tunes or whatever it might be. People don't spend they don't it's a, they don't buy the right amount of tools for the year for sure. And conversely, how long does it take that? Automatic edger to eat up a, a grinding wheel. Uh, so you're going to get about 100 tunes out of that. So I, I did the math on that too. So 
100 tunes per year, using the consumables for hand tuning versus buying the Evo and the discs. Uh, the break even point is 100 tunes. And then you own the machine, and then you're only buying the $60 replacement disc. So the cost per tune with this machine over two years is substantially lower. Uh, a couple questions. If we're not with our kids on snow, go back as you well. Yep. Would you always be tuned with a gummy? You know, if you're tuned at night, they're going to be on snow. You know, would you just be tuned at that five times in there? Yeah. If, I think it's probably a little easier here. I, you guys, you don't really have ice too often. I mean, I, 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 you might get it. But compared to like where I live, you guys don't have ice. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, in the ski room, you could probably be pretty safe by making that adjustment the night before. But and you would always do that five, 10, 15. Yeah, that works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of chip away at it. I'd say as, as for the younger ages, I always recommend be tuned to fifth and tail to give that forgiveness. And as you get older and more proficient and you know exactly what you like, then you start to play around with how much you be tuned. So and how far be, back do you be tuned to fifth and tail? I do pretty much exactly what Jared said. With the gummy, that yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. This is this is an easy tool to handle. You know, like, and you can spend some time with your racer to just kind of show them how it works. You know, it's something that a youngster can use for sure. But maybe, uh, maybe they lean on the coach on like whether or not they should do it. Well, with the soft gummy, so you can you can come up and feel it. It, it you can't do any damage other than just dull that dull that edge back a little bit. Right. So it's easy to learn for for that. Yes, for sure. You know, like I was talking about how I, how I only use liquids on slalom skis. I'd use the TS for racing. This is the high end. And then, uh, yeah, I, this for racing, I would definitely be in the TS category. So you'd be fine. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, this stuff's awesome. Like the the test results on this are really good.